Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord, the Lord is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Can you believe it? We've now been saying this acclamation for three Sundays. Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. And if we were here a couple of years ago now at the Easter Vigil, we would have heard it joyfully proclaimed amid bells and singing, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Can you believe it? Can we believe the story that we hear this morning? Maybe now that we're into the third Sunday of Easter, we can start to reflect and unpack that story that we heard on Easter morning about those women coming early to the tomb. In Luke's gospel, the disciple themselves, when they hear the women tell their story, understand it to be an idle tale, as many today think of it. We ask maybe, well, what really happened? We hear these stories in the New Testament about the resurrection, but what really happened? You know, one explanation, for example, is, is not unlike what Joan Didion talks about in her memoir that came out in 2005 called The Year of Magical Thinking, where she chronicles the, the a time from the uh, sudden death of her husband to something of a resolution that happens uh, a, a year later. And, and she recounts how she would be hoping that somehow he might come back to life again. And maybe that's what happened, it, sort of magical thinking. But Luke reports something very different. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Think back at the response of those first women at the tomb in Mark's gospel where he reports, they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The first disciples never expected a resurrection. They certainly could understand what it meant to grieve, and that's why those women came early to visit the cemetery on that first Easter morning, and that's why they gathered together to mourn, as we often do for our beloved dead. And maybe they had heard of ghost stories, but they knew that people did not rise from the dead. But then the earth shifts under their feet, the first response is not unmitigated joy, it is terror. And Jesus speaks to them and says, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I myself. Strange, that invitation, isn't it? When we see people and we want to recognize them, we often don't look at their hands and their feet what we look at is their faces as a rule. But Jesus invites them to look at his hands and his feet. What had those hands done? Those hands that had reached out in healing. Those hands that had took bread and broke it and blessed it and fed multitudes. And where had those feet walked when they first met him at the Sea of Galilee and called those fishermen to follow him, walking all the way to Jerusalem. And those hands and feet that on this morning bore the scars of his passion. He had gone through great torture and death, and, and it even seems that, that he doubted that he would ever be rescued. Why have you forsaken me, he says from the cross. But even at that moment, even when he maybe even doubted that there was a God, Jesus says, into your hands I commend my spirit. The most desperate of human experiences 
And he doesn't erase these. He transforms them because they recognized him in those nail-scarred hands and feet. I shared an opinion piece in the New York Times on Easter weekend on Facebook by Peter Weiner that was titled, Why is Jesus Still Wounded After His Resurrection? He quotes Makoto Fujimura about the Japanese art of kintsugi, in which broken pottery is repaired with lacquer dusted in gold. And he notes that, that these had been before simply ordinary pieces of pottery, but in their brokenness, they become transformed into beautiful and new works of art. The brokenness itself becomes essential to the new creation. And so similarly, Jesus takes our doubts and our pain and our shame, our woundedness and even death itself and transforms it into his new creation. Beloved children of God is what we are named. Crown him the Lord of love, the old hymn tells us. Behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. Our reading from 1 John this morning gives us the hope that when he is fully revealed, we too shall be like him. But then in our gospel account this morning, Jesus gives the disciples this invitation, touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. He is flesh and blood, but flesh and blood enlivened and transformed as something new, something beautiful, a new creation, that same Jesus, the same Jesus they knew, but glorified. And this risen Jesus bridges two realities, the old world where we understand what's going on, we understand death and pain and mourning, and we understand that those things are real. The world, as Father Dan described it on Easter morning, as the world of is, is what it is. But Jesus transforms that old world, and a new creation, a new dimension of reality is set forth on that Easter day. And the message of Easter is not primarily about going to heaven when you die. The message of Easter is that the risen Jesus is the firstborn of a whole new creation, refreshed and reborn and renewed, that God's great spring cleaning, his restoration project is underway. But this is not simply a dream or a philosophy or a principle, but a person. It is already a material reality in the flesh of the risen Jesus and in the life of his living body in the world. That means us. And that's why the first words that Jesus speaks to his apostles are these, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Shalom, well-being. The world is being put right. Justice is on the horizon. Relationships are being restored. God and humanity are once again at peace. Peace be with you. And Jesus says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead, and on the third day that repentance and forgiveness and sins is to be proclaimed is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Now, the whole New Testament is really the expression of Jesus' statement here in Luke's Gospel. 
those first witnesses reflect on that experience of Easter Day in light of their whole experience of Jesus, and they describe it in light of the Scriptures as they knew them. And they want you to know that they are witnesses that these things took place. They are handing on to us what they experienced. As the beginning of the first letter of John says, we announce to you what existed from the beginning, that we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what our hands handled about the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen, and we testify and announce to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also announce it to you so that you may have fellowship with us. Those first apostles didn't simply come to believe that Jesus' message lived on after him. They saw and heard the power of God at work, and it transformed everything they knew about reality. The Word was made flesh and lived among us in the risen Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is a material reality that transcends the material world. The resurrection of Jesus is a historical reality that transcends history. And yet, it isn't just about Jesus and his first disciples. These things were written, as St. John's Gospel told us last week, that we may believe, and that believing, we will have life in his name. And so we also have that apostolic mission given to us to proclaim this good news that the risen Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has been set loose in the world and that a new creation has begun. And whether we are behind locked doors on the first day of the week or in a garden or wherever you are this morning or wherever you are as you listen to these words, the one who stood amongst those first disciples is with us, and we are part of that movement that began in the springtime outside Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago, and we are agents of that new creation today. And now that work has been delivered from the very nail-scarred hands of Jesus to his disciples and to you and to me to announce the way of forgiveness and love that these things are realities and that Jesus himself is bringing about this renewal of the whole world. He is risen and we will one day rise again in our glorified and wounded bodies on that great getting up morning. But it's not just for then because it is for now, today. The project of renewing all things has begun, and we are witnesses of these things.